We have a great show for you today. Don't go anywhere. Don't touch the dial. We'll be right back. Welcome back to 30 Frames a Second. As you know, I'm Greg Lasseter. Today, I have an amazing guest. This guy's unbelievable. I've always heard about him. He's been friends on my Facebook. And now that I see, I get a chance to interview him. His name is Roy R. Paul. But before we talk to Roy, we're going to introduce his promo to his organization called Sensibility. So don't go anywhere. Check this out. I wrote my first book back in the day, just when Generation X just said, okay, we have debt, how do we manage it? Now all of a sudden we've got all these different financial products from prepaid cards, you know, to HELOCs, to reverse mortgages. It's become so complicated that it's almost impossible to keep up with it because the problem is too is that we're not taught this mandatorily in our schools. You know, most of the surveys show that most of us learn at home. This was our first year teaching um, personal finance and economics, and I thought it was a really great way to almost supplement what our curriculum was, um, and it turned out to be something that the students could actually um, hear professionals in their opinion, and they can see like real world experience, because as a teacher, there's, al there's only so much I can say to a student that they actually retain it when they see someone that you know, works in finance or, or works as an accountant or, or works as a, a uh, financial planner come into the room and give them real advice. It kind of hits home because it's, it's something that's real to them. And a lot of our teens are uh, not financially savvy. They go to the check cashing place and you know they have to pay to get their checks cashed. So I think it's important for them to learn how to manage their money wisely. I've done banking for rich people, poor people, all types of people, and I've seen a lot of kids just have absolutely no idea about financial literacy, uh, adults too. And I was looking for a really good program that I can get involved with and that's networked with schools and I can teach the kids. So I joined Sensibility, and I got to say that their material is really concise. It's almost, I feel like when, I, when I'm teaching the kids with sens in Sensibility, and they're engaged and they're listening and they're learning, I feel like, you know, their families and, 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 and you know, their, their mom and dad should be here because they would learn as well. So, so as a finance student, 
I came across sensibility and I thought, like, what a wonderful way to be able to give what I've learned back to people that were in the situation that I grew up in. Oh, so yeah, so because of the program, I actually started saving more, and my parents noticed, started, actually noticed, noticed it. I'm the, I'm the only person who never has any money, or have like maybe a couple of dollars after I, after I just got paid. So that's my parents noticed to it, and I'm surprised now. Sometimes people actually couldn't to borrow money. Yeah, I mentioned to my brother, because he saves, but then the money he ends up saving, he wastes it. So, you know, I told him, like, you know, you can save, like, if you get 20, save maybe like 10. Put 10 aside and then waste the 10, and like little by little it builds up. And then before you realize you have more money than you started out with, and you actually spend it later. Like, uh, when I was making my college decision, I was thinking about like the loans and stuff like that because he can also um, spoke to us about like loans and interest rates and stuff like that. So then I started thinking about them, that also helped to make my college decision. Um, I went home to, well, to my girlfriend at the time, and she was like, I gotta buy these shoes, and they like $200, and I was like, Come on, you gotta, do you really need those? You know what I'm saying? Like, you gotta think about what you really need. And I was like, actually, we got, we was arguing a little bit, you know, having a little, you know how it goes. And I was like, we actually had a little workshop today and they was discussing, you know, money and how to manage your money and how to really be responsible because when you get older, you're really gonna need. And I was like, yo, how much did you save, you think, this year? And she said something ridiculous, like $10 or $20 or something like that. So I was like, you gotta really work on that. You know, ever since then, like, she really took that, and I really went, you know, and helped her, and she really helped me, and I told my moms about it, and I was like, Ma, I really gonna help you around. We could save, like, 20 on my check every month and throw it in the savings, you know, just to, just to make sure we got some money. It's, it's nice to see them feel inspired. Um, they think that uh, Christian is a millionaire. Um, they also think that it's obtainable for them to become millionaires. Um, and at the same time, they also realize that it's not going to be handed to them. And they've thought about it. I always get a few interesting questions about um, where they should put their money, how they can you know, get a degree that's going to help them make more money. They're starting to get interested in this concept of having their money work for them. Sensibility is a great program. I, I, I get the jitters every time you know, I enter a classroom for the first time. And when I leave, it's that same feeling of excitement and accomplishment when you see somebody really benefit and light up with the things that you're expressing to them and teaching them, it's really fulfilling and and I'm just excited to keep participating in the program. I would definitely recommend um, Sensibility because it makes a difference to one person because, you know, they can have this mentality that saving is not that important, but it actually is because it leads up to the future. So I would definitely recommend it. That's why I'm glad that I took this. Um, little workshop we have because, you know, I'm really cautious and careful about the way I spend my money and now I'm willing to save and willing to encourage other people to save as well. Boy, what you're doing is so amazing that not only that you're molding young minds and how to use money, but you could use that, some adults can use it too, <laughs> you know. But tell us how sensibility, how did it all come about? Sure. So Sensibility was founded in 2004. Two students at Harvard Business School got together and realized that their, within their immediate family and their peers, many of them business students, they really didn't understand how to manage their personal finances. Now, some of them went on to careers in finance and I'm sure got much more savvier as they went along, but many of them in some cases came from pretty wealthy families and had no idea how to manage the money that they had. And so they got together and said, well, if we and we have friends who don't have the necessary skills, what about young people in particularly poor communities? Mm -hmm. So they, it started off as an idea 
uh, in 2002, three, and then they fully incorporated it in 2004. And it really started as sort of a grassroots movement for many years. It was just, you know, them two volunteering, their friends volunteering. And Sensibility was the name, but there was really no structure to it. Right. Uh, not until 2008, when we were somewhat adopted by Societe Generale, the French wow. bank. Um, <laughs> and that's when, you know, we were getting some serious funding from the bank. We had office space on Park Avenue. We we were, you know, developing some real meat and structure to to the organization, um, and then from 2008 until I came on board this year, um, it really was sort of run by a, a few executive directors here and there with mm -hmm. some staff. And so, you know, my hiring because of my background in education and politics is really to sort of bring the organization to the next level and to the sure. next phase of what I think the vision is for the organization. So. I've been working over the past few months to, to, to flush out that vision and really start making some relationships, some key areas that I think cannot just make this a thing, but, but make it really something that can grow and be sustainable over a period of time. Sure. So, Roy, tell me a little bit about, tell us a little bit about your background and you, um, what made you become, this is a big deal. This is, you're on Park Avenue, you're running a, soon to be, a, I'm sure, Fortune for Fortune 500 organization. <laughs> what is your background in, in finance? Is your background in finance? Uh, Where'd you grow up? No, like so finance? I grew. Uh, my parents uh, both immigrated from the United States Virgin Islands. Uh -huh. uh, my mother is from a place called Saint Vincent in the Grenadines, and my dad is from a place called Saint Croix. Grew up in Grenada. Uh, and they both came to the U.S. after getting married. Uh, I was born in the Bronx uh, and spent, I would say, about the first eight, nine years of my life being raised in the South Bronx. Uh, and growing up, it was um, not the best community to be in. Um, was surrounded by uh, project uh, housing and, and people who, you know, went to all public schools. Right, sure. uh, and so I grew up in a, a, a third floor walk up. Mm -hmm apartment on uh, in the South Bronx and that was around the time when I was in middle school where the Bloods and the Crips were really sort of claiming their territory right. in particular the Bronx and along the route I had about a four or five block walk from my house to the elementary school that I went to PS 93 um, and then later CS 152 and I remember part of the initiation for the gangs was they would hide in bushes and at the behest of one of their leaders, right. they would run out of the bushes with box cutters and slash people across the face. Uh, that was how they would initiate some people into the gang to make sure that you were tough enough to really get right. with the program. And so along that same route that I took, there was another youngster in my school who got initiated got slashed across the face. And that's when my mother said, okay, that could have been you. We're out of here. Really? So, <laughs> Which was going to be my next question. Yeah, How we're did out you evade that? Right. right. Uh, and so we spent summers in Orange County, New York, Middletown, which was and still is vastly different night and day from oh, yeah. the Bronx. Uh, and <laughs> and so I loved going up there in the summers. I was like, I don't want to live up there. I mean, they, they, you know, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's a diverse, but it's really a very suburban community. Right. And remote. Right, and, and there, it's not really urban, you know, right. there, there are really no corner bodegas. Right. You have to get in your car and drive to Walmart or somewhere, right. wherever right. people right. go. Um, you know, you drive down the street, there's a lot of trees. It's, and I said, I don't want to live here. I mean, right. it's great to vacation here, right. but sure. I need a balance. Right. And my mother said, no, this is where we're staying. And so uh, it was, I think, a formative period of my time because I learned to adapt and assimilate to a different community, different way of life. Right. Uh, and so it, it was good up until about high school, I think, when I really understood what it meant to be in a community mm -hmm. and really contribute. Mm -hmm. And I was in high school, and I remember it as if it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. I was uh, in a high school class, and the teacher said, you have to take the readiness exams. It's not, you know, this test isn't really an indicator of how well you can do, but follow these steps, you'll pass, don't have to worry about it. And I sat there, and I said, well, then why are we taking the test? It didn't make any sense to <laughs> right. me. Unless it's going to be definitive in some way, why do it? Right. Uh, she said, well, this is just a state standard. And being the rebellious guy that I was back then, I said, well, then we should change the state standard. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Right, 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 let's, right. let's tell the people who are experts right. that they're not doing it the right way. Right. Uh, and so there was, uh, at that time, just happened coincidentally, there was a statewide movement uh, to really put some teeth into the Regents exam. Merrill Tish was a chancellor at the time. And they were trying to um, low, uh, increase the cutoff point. Mm -hmm. 
because you needed a 65 to pass a regular exam, right. but you needed a 55 to pass the Regents because the statewide, right. so many people were failing right. that so they, they lowered the, the story. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, if that's right. not a scam, I don't know what right. is. And so I got on a statewide movement to say, you know, we got to put some teeth into this mm -hmm. and let it really reflect what people mm -hmm. are doing in the classroom mm -hmm. and in life. And, uh, you know, started speaking on different legislative panels in Albany, got really close to some of the elected officials that represented my area, got an internship with the local congressman right. out of it. Um, and, you know, being involved in the local education scene, the, when I graduated, um, someone who was on the Board of Education re uh, retired, was moving to Florida. And uh, someone said, you know, you've been very outspoken, you've been involved in education issues, you're out of the system, why don't you run for the school board? And I said, no, you, you, you can't run for the school right. board. I was 18 years old. Okay. I said, you need to have an, you know, an EDD or a PhD. PhD right? <laughs> right. Um, I didn't have doctor in front or behind my name. So I right. said, no one's going to elect me to the school board. Uh, and so then I started to really think about it and couldn't really think of a reason why I shouldn't have been right. on the school board. I thought I was a perfect candidate. Um, and so I started to really think about how this would actually formulate itself into a plan of action, into mm -hmm. a campaign. And... You know, there were a few hurdles along the way. There were people who didn't want me to get elected. And in Why? one case, well, I think they, they didn't like the fact that I was very outspoken. Right. I didn't understand then, but really understand and fully understand now that the powers that be, many oftentimes the party bosses and the people who understand how the system really works, right. really want people they can control. Right, absolutely. And I was not someone that they could control. Right. There was nothing they could promise me. I didn't have family members right. who were teachers who needed jobs. Right. And so they said, well, there's really nothing we could do for him, so right. we don't want him on the board. He's really going to speak his mind. Right. <laughs> and so they put up a candidate against me who was, um, she was African-American. There was no African-American at that time on the board. Nine right. member board, 70% majority minority district. Right. And wow. so we needed minority representation. And uh, so they put up an African-American grandmother who had custody of her granddaughter. And wow. I went to one meeting and the person who orchestrated this movement came to me and said, you see, we got you. There's no way people in this community are going to elect you over a grandmother who has custody of her granddaughter. Because they controlled her by she getting custody of her granddaughter. Uh, they didn't control her, but they knew that she was not someone that would be as outspoken as I would. Correct. So okay. they figured to the voting public looking at me, 18 year old, and I looked like I was 12, <laughs> uh, sitting alongside her at a debate and uh, John Perino at the time who um, you know, was a senior member in the community. Right. They said, there's no way this kid's gonna win. Uh, and I, to be quite honest with you, didn't think that I was going to win. <laughs> right. It was, uh, it was. I thought, a labor sacrifice for the community. I thought, if nothing else, I would get great experience. But I really took it seriously. It was about 11,000 eligible voters. It was a, you know, it was a fairly large group of, of, of people who could vote but really had never been engaged. Right. No one knew what a school board was, what they did, uh, even though it was a high portion of property taxes, which is very much different in how it's balanced in right. New York I'm City. Just say, right. But upstate, property taxes is really what rules Expenses. the day. Expenses, exactly, right. and that's controlled by the school board. They right. set the local property taxes right. for your school district. And so, you know, they're, in some cases, more important and more crucial than the water bills that you pay and Absolutely. the taxes on your home. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I was really trying to educate people about that, and maybe pe some people were flattered right. <laughs> that there's <laughs> 18 year old is at their door talking to them about the right. school board. Um, and I really connected with older white women, particularly grandmothers, wow. which is the demographic they thought for sure would go to the grandmother in the right. race, which right. is why they put her up. Um, and then on election night, there was all of this brouhaha, you know, they were going to read the results and they invited everyone to come down and everyone's supporters were there and it was going to be a big party. And I didn't go because right. I thought, you know, why, why go and lose? And then you have to come up with the way to kind of express that you're not upset that you lost. Right, right, right. You know, right, the, right, you sure. know when you're at, concede, right. right, you're watching the Academy Awards and, you know, they scan the nominees <laughs> right, and they right. put the, the camera on their face right, and sure. they all have to kind of look happy. Right. And, <laughs> and then when right. they, the name isn't called, you know, they have to be poised. Right. They have to make sure. it look like they're a team sport. And so I was like, I don't, I don't want to do that. And, and, and so uh, someone called me that night on election night and said, why aren't you here? And I said, why would I attend something if I know I'm not going to win? And they said, you fool, you won. 
<laughs> and so, of course, I run, put some clothes on, get in the car, drive down. Right, right, sure. <laughs> and then I walk in like I knew I was going to win the whole time. I was like, yes, thank you. Uh, but I won by 26 votes. It was a very wow. close election. No recount? Um, uh, no recount. Um, I, I didn't think that I was going to win, but I, I did, served five years, mm -hmm. and learned a lot, particularly about the education system in New York State, right. uh, which I thought was incredibly rigged towards people who had resources, right, sure. which is, I think, common in almost every sector of life. Right. Right, having right, more sure. money and gives you more access and more right. options and for those who don't have you have no access right, and sure. no options and we know that in the school system depending on where you live you're zoned right right absolutely you have to send your kid to this school if you live in a particular community in, in new york state not in new york city new york state and new york city it was zoned at one point oh then, right at one point okay yeah. sure and so people who had access didn't have that issue right you right. could live in new york and you can send your kid to dalton or you can send your kid to boarding school in new hampshire right sure and no one said Said, no, you can't send your kid to that boarding school in New Hampshire. Right. You got to send them to the local public school in your community, right? right. So uh, you have money, you have resources, you have lobbying interest, etc. Right. And so I really saw my role on that school board as uh, really a connector to people who didn't have access to those who could make decisions, and those were the lawmakers. And right. so I really understood how important it was to have that relationship. And so I learned a lot. We had a $140 million budget. I learned about how to place things out of the budget and how to put things into the budget. Uh, everyone has their pet projects and the things that that are important to them, right? right and, and, sure. and because you have a seat at the table, they need your vote to pass the right. budget. <laughs> so they want to make you happy. And right, so, sure. you know, you know, Mr. Paul, what would you like to see passed? Right. And, you know, and I knew that right. if, depending on what my interest was and the people who supported me, there were one thing that I could get and I would go and advocate for that. And I would almost get it because no one's going to say anything against someone who wants, you know, they, who they, they, they need their vote from. Right. So it's, it's a political system, but I really enjoyed it. We had two law firms representing us. I learned how law firms work right, and how sure. they treat clients. Right, sure. um, we were building new schools, reconstructing old ones, and uh, learning how that construction process works, change orders. Uh, Robert Moses had a famous saying, once the shovel is in the ground, it is very difficult to cancel a project. Right. So you sign the dotted line, and there's a contract for $50 million, and then all of a sudden, things start coming down the pike, and they say, well, we have to do this, and the cost for this went up. But once the shovel is in the ground, you can't say, no, stop the project. We're not paying more than $50 50 million because now the shovel is there. The right. hole has been dug and you've right. got to fill it, right? right? And so all the little tricks of the trade, and of course, none of that precludes uh, change orders because right. that's just the way that right. construction the works. Right. Right. Sure. So once you understand how it works, you say, well, we're going to sign a contract for 50, but it's really going to be like 60, 65 million, right? right? <laughs> right. So you, you get used to understanding how it works, right. lobbying interest, the teachers union, making sure they're happy or, or making sure they're not happy, depending right, on which right, side right, of the right, table sure. you want it to be on. So I learned a great deal from being on that school board. How uh, long is that? How long was that? Term. Interestingly enough, when I got elected, they were five-year terms, and I thought that was an incredibly long period of time. And so I said, we really should lower the length of terms. I was really an advocate for the people having a decision in the process, right. and I didn't get any support on the board for that. Of course, they all wanted five-year terms. They wanted to be there as long as they could, and they wanted to run for election and be a, you know, so someone you, who had an incumbent C sure. status, and you know, they've been on the board for five years, so who wouldn't know them if right. they were paying attention? Right. And so they said, no, we don't really like that idea. And so I said, well, if we can't get a vote here at the table, then we're going to put it up as a referendum on the people, right. and they're going to decide. Right, right. And then, of course, at that point, they were like, oh, well, we love the idea. <laughs> it's wonderful. We should. Right. Why don't we think That's of this before? Right. And it was amazing because in private session, when no one was watching, people didn't like the idea. Mm -hmm. Then public referendum talks happened. The public supported it and approved right. it. And in public, everyone said, this is a wonderful idea. Congrats. Right. And I said, but you weren't for it. <laughs> right. Now you now you are, right? Because we're in public. I got it. It was your idea. Um, it was my idea. Right. Um, I went to a parent meeting for um, a group of Hispanics who mm. were parents in the district. And they were, I think, the most educated for me because I understood that English language speakers have a privilege in this right. country. Those right. who don't speak English as their first language don't have that privilege. Right. Uh, and it was explained to me how on a ballot, when you vote for a referendum mm. or November 7th, mm. if you go to vote for local elections, sometimes you have names that are there, they're in English, but you have to flip the ballot over and right. there are propositions. Right. And we had school board propositions the same way on November, you have the proposition for the Constitutional Convention. And parents were saying, that stuff is in English, and while we can 
can speak in some cases fluently to have a conversation. Right. We don't understand how to speak, uh, read in, in, in English. It, right. It's difficult for right. us. Right. And so I said, oh, well, we should just print it in Spanish. I mean, it seemed like a no-brainer to me. Right. I right. took that back to the board. We were in private session, and they said, oh, no, we don't need to do that. We don't need to do that. We don't need to do that. Referendum. We don't need to do that. <laughs> and so I said, well, let's let the public decide, right? right? And then the way that they wanted to sort of make it pass muster, as one person said, well, then we should have it in Italian, and then we should have it. Chinese, <laughs> right. and so on, and so on, right? Exactly. And so that ended up did having had it in Spanish and Italian, and I didn't think we needed it in Italian, of course. <laughs> right. But it was, it was their way of saying, well, let's get some, you know, it was, it was nonsense right, to be right, honest right, with you. Right. But I understood how negotiation works, and right, I said, yeah. if you can't get everything you want, at least get something, and right. we achieve the goal. Right. Um, and so that's the part of bargaining that's very difficult sure. in the public sector, because right. you, you know that in the private sector, this stuff would never happen. And the yeah, CEO right. would say, this is what we're doing, and this everyone would, right. right, 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 right. Uh, but I had a great experience, and after five years, I said, this is not something that I want to continue doing. Someone else should but do this. But you were this. good at it. You were great at it. I, I thought I was. <laughs> I thought I was, and I had a great deal of fun. Right. It was, I loved learning. I loved being involved in the process. Um, but I really wanted other people to get that opportunity, and I think far too often we have people in elected office mm. who who stay there and they make careers out of it, and right. they jump around. You know, you, one day you wake up there in the state assembly, then you wake up and they're in Congress, and then you wake up there running for mayor. And you go, wait right. a second, like what else can right. you do? Right, <laughs> right, 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 right. Sure. Uh, and uh, they're institutionalized, and people love the power and the prestige. They walk into a room, congressman, right, and right. they get very <laughs> excited about that. They, you know, their egos have, right. have been filled. Sure. Uh, and, and I was never really that type. Um, now, do I think that there are cases in which there are some people who are better than others at public policy? Sure. Absolutely. And we need to support those people. But in the cases in which they're just sort of there to, to sort of do nothing and get right. reelected, right. then we it's need to. Time, exactly. Right. And so I said, let someone else do this. I wanted to go to graduate school. But when I did that, I put uh, an obligatory post on Facebook. You know, after five years, it's been wonderful, right, yada, right, yada, right. yada. Sure. Uh, and a producer at ABC um, uh, got wind of my story because when I was elected, I was the, um, the youngest African American in the state of New York to get elected to any office. But especially being where you're from, Middletown, that mm -hmm. was a predominantly that wasn't a predominantly black community. No, was it? no not it was predominantly all white. black. Orange County, yeah, upstate. Yeah, yeah it's it's very did rural. That, did very that suburban. run into any kind of an issue when you were running um, the race thing? Uh, not when I was running. Um, it, it came a part of the discussion when I started talking about these initiatives, right. uh, in particular the Spanish ballot, right? right. Uh, then people started to say, well, wait a second, then, you know, we, we didn't know he was going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, we knew he was outspoken, but we didn't know he was going to do that. Um, Change the game. Exactly. So I kind of pushed the envelope, and then I kept pushing, because I thought we should all just keep pushing envelopes, right? Sure. right? That's, what we, that's how progress happens. Right. Um, and sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but at least talk about it and right. debate and have a conversation. And so, um, you know, after I decided I wasn't going to run again, went to go to graduate school, and I had a radio show at the New School University. Right. And my media was media and film. That was my major. Right. Uh, and I had a great time interviewing people. Um, again, underestimated. My entire life, I've been underestimated. Right. And I've loved that because I've always been able to exceed right, people's sure. expectations of me. Um, and um, I went to the producer at the New School Radio, and I said, I want this radio show, online podcast. I think I'll be good at it. Right. And he said, well, who do you think you can get? You know, I didn't have any experience right. hosting anything, really. I love that. <laughs> and I said, well, I can get my Angelo, and I can get some other people. You know David Dinkins, and he said, "Oh, you think you can get those people?" And he said, "Well, put a list together. If you think you can get them, you know, run with it. But you know, you don't really have an experience in this, so you kind of be learning as you go." <laughs> and I said, "Okay, that's fun." But I studied. You know, right. I loved Ed Bradley and people who were in the right, media sure. industry. And so I said, "I'm going to give this a go." And uh, called Dr. Angelo. Uh, she corrected I saw that me. Uh, she. Uh, I called to my Angelo by accident. It was really an <laughs> she accident. Didn't like that, she right? didn't like that. She said, "It's Dr. <laughs> Angelo." To you. And I said, so sorry. I don't know why I said that. It was a slip of the tongue. I apologize. I'm going to go read all, your, all of your poems. Um, and so did that interview and had a great run, you know, at Koch, uh, who, who I can say, and I don't say this because he's no longer here, but, you know, it wasn't a particularly great interview. Uh, you know, right. he, he wasn't the nicest interviewee. Right. Um, he's not a nice person. Uh, I didn't say it. that. I didn't say that. <laughs> I can say that. He wasn't, he's not a nice person. I met him. He's not a nice person. It wasn't the easiest and the smoothest <laughs> interview, but I won't say that. Uh, David Dinkins, who was great, and right. in fact, uh, um, I was supposed to interview um, Jenny Lumet, who was a granddaughter of Lena Horne. Right. 
And uh, I was telling David Dinkins this because I really wanted to do that. It, it was uh, every interview had its own name, right. and uh, the one with Lena Horne uh, was going to name it something after one of her songs, "Stormy Weather." And, right, right. And it was great, song. and I wanted to do it. Uh, and so I was telling David Dinkins, I'm having so much trouble with Jenna Lumet, who said she would do it, and then I couldn't get a hold of her. Uh, and so he said, well, then I'll do the interview on Lena Horne. I knew her very well, and he had great stories. And this wasn't too long ago, but he, I believe he was maybe in his late 70s. He's mm -hmm. prob oh, probably early 80s. Right. And so he was, you know, still lucid and had stories. I mean, called, you know, you know, years ago when she would headline a fundraiser. She was on Broadway. And right. uh, so I learned all these stories, and I loved that about doing that interview mm -hmm. uh, series. Um, and had a great time with it. Sarah Dash from LaBelle. Right, yeah, uh, and uh, she's my god aunt, Sarah, aunt Sarah, really? and and she talked about um, you know the, the the career behind Labelle and, and right. the song and, and how it all came about, and then you know the difficulties she had in her life to get to where she is now. Right. So um, I did that, and then uh, I got an amazing opportunity with ABC to do political commentary. So right. I did that several times and really honed my skill of being in front of a camera, talking about sure. different issues on the whim. Right? They were very little, right. you know, prompting and 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 notes on it, and I, I really loved it. I said, this is all fascinating. And I wanted, I grew up wanting to be a lawyer, and then I said, well, I really like this whole broadcasting thing. Right, Maybe right. I should give this a go. <laughs> uh, and, and then that didn't really quite work for me because New York is such a terrible right. market right. to try to be on television. Right. And ABC was doing hiring freezes. They loved hiring freezes. Everyone loves hiring freezes. I don't know why people love hiring. Just give away the money, right? right? right and I always sure. said, take it from Matt Lauer. Right. Just, take, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or or, or uh, uh, what's his name? The guy who lives down the street from me. Al Roker. Yeah. Al Roker, right? Oh, they, they're making millions of dollars and they have hiring freezes. Like, how do you justify that? That doesn't make any sense right. to me. Uh, and so, Ken, you know, again, I was, you know, being controversial. You're not supposed to say that. You know, right. you can't be in ABC right. studios and say too loudly <laughs> that they should take money away from Deborah Roberts. Right. right. Can't do that. Uh, and so, again, I was like, all right, Roy, you're just being too controversial now, too outspoken, which I was used to at that point. Uh, and uh, then I got involved in a nonprofit uh, that dealt with young people in the foster care system and the need to adopt older people. Wow. Uh, they get at age t 18, they age out and have nowhere to go. Right. And so I did a lot of government work and, and outreach work for them. And then I ran for office again. I don't know why I did that. Oh. It was a, a terrible idea in hindsight. <laughs> uh, I can say that now because right. it's over. But it was a terrible idea. I had no business doing it. Um, but I learned a lot. And what I, office did you run for? I ran for the New York State Assembly. Uh, Barbara Clark right. had been in the Assembly for 30 years, and she passed away, unfortunately. And uh, the system couldn't be rigged because the powers that be were hoping that it was going to be a special election. And right. special elections are the worst, really. Right, right. Because the so party bosses <laughs> get together, they nominate a Democrat, and that's the only person who can be a Democrat on the ballot, right? right? right. And so even if you have other people who are great, well-known, people, the masses, go into the booth, they see Democrat next to your name, they vote for right, you, right? right. It's, it's instinct. And so it's a traditional way that people have gotten their people into office. And then once you're there, you're an incumbent, it's hard to get you out. And so they couldn't do that. It was going to be an open primary season. And I said, all right, great, I'm going to run, right? And uh, got through the campaign season and got seen the ups and downs of right. that. And I thought that I w had a lot of experience running on a school board, being on a school right, board. Right. But New York City has so nothing on it. Has anyone. a whole different vibe, right? And, uh, you know, there are people who would say to you, you know, Roy, I'm, I'm going to support you. I think you're wonderful. Thank you. Get off the phone. A week later, you go to a campaign event, and they're across the street <laughs> holding a sign for someone else. And I go, go, wait a second. I, did we just talk? Like, what happened? Oh, man, I'm so sorry. Someone got to me. But I was like, you know what? I was, <laughs> I was just going to hang this up. You, know, you get on the phone. The union people know what they want to do and who right. they're going to support. Right, right, right. And, you know, you call them up and go, do, do you have a, an idea what you're going to do? No, I have no clue. On Facebook, they're at a campaign event for my opponent. I said, what? I thought you had no idea what you were going to do. But the thing, Greg, is that I would call people out on it. Right, right? that's even better. And right? they hated me for that. It made them so uncomfortable, and I loved it. Because right. I would call them up, and right. I would say, wait a second. So you said you were supporting me. I saw you at so-and-so event. And they go, oh, oh, but, 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 but. I had one person. I won't tell you who he is and what you Come on, Roy, come on. Come on, tell us, Roy. <laughs> <laughs> that would be terrible. Uh, and uh, I, I called him out on it. I said, you know exactly what you're going to do. You should have told me, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and he said, you know what? In 30-something years of doing this, I've never had anyone talk to me like you. I said, well, this is, the, 
No, it wasn't Charlie. <laughs> and I said, well, this there's a first time for everything. Right. And I hung up the phone on him. No. And I bet you he's never had anybody in 30 years hang up the phone <laughs> right, on him, right? right? And so they really weren't used to me, and I didn't really care. Uh, because you had nothing to lose. I had nothing right. to lose, and, and I was really running on a reform platform. Right. But we had money, we had right. support, right. Um, and they didn't think we were going to raise any money. We did. We came, and I think second uh, at one point in, in fundraising. Right. Wow. Um, and so it was it was a pretty robust campaign, and that's when they really didn't like me. Right. But I had no union support. Right. Wow. Um, and um, you know, I didn't win, but right. I didn't lose. Right. 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 You got an experience. Uh, I got the experience, right. and I met so many wonderful people. We had helped people during the campaign who had told. Us. We called so and so's office, so and so's office. We didn't get any work right. done, you know, right, for sure. our issues. Uh, and uh, there was one block association in Cambria Heights, and they had a vacant property dilapidated next door. Right. Uh, these row homes that were connected together, and they've been trying to work with the bank to get the bank to come board the home up. Mm -hmm. uh, and they called every office they can think of. No one helped them with this issue. And they told me about this thing uh, during the campaign, and I said, you know what? I'm going to get a lawyer friend of mine. I'm going to write a letter to the bank. Right, right. right. Um, and uh, he did. He wrote the letter. We sent it up. Two weeks later, they came and boarded up the home. Wow. And they were like, oh, wow. That, that, that was quick. <laughs> right. And maybe it was the name of the law firm on the letterhead. But I know how to get things done. And right, I sure. think people saw that. Uh, and uh, I earned every bit of the 600 votes I got, right? <laughs> every, I think those 600 people are the smartest people in the 33rd Assembly District, okay? They're the smartest people. Uh, and, and I love them dearly. Right, and, right, and sure. So um, it was a great experience. Um, and then after the campaign was over, um, I found myself in a really awkward situation because I had taken a leave of absence, and then I couldn't go back on that. Right. And then I had to find something else to do. So I was doing what a lot of people do in New York. They start throwing out straws, right? You send right, out you right, know, right. blast BCC emails. Right, right. And, <laughs> right. you know, I need a job. I need, you know, the, the rent's too darn right. high. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right. And so it was like, I got to pay the rent. And of course, right. landlords don't care if you don't right. have the money to right. pay, if you don't, you know, they you don't work, and they out. want their money, or you leave. And so I couldn't be homeless after right. running for office. I mean, <laughs> right. how does that look? Right, right. And so it just so happened that Sensibility was looking for a new executive director. And I did some research on the company. Financial literacy and education issues was something that was very passionate to me. I knew about curriculum development. And so I said, this is something that I can take to the next level. They had a good meat of support right. uh, because of society general and a couple of things. So I said, this is something that I can work with. And then I networked my way into the role. They had been conducting wow. a hiring search for several months. And I saw who the chair of the board was. And uh, on Facebook, she knew someone that I knew. And I oh, called him and I said, help degrees. connect me. Yeah, I was like, right. you know, just network this. And I think they were impressed by that. Right. Because they really needed someone who knew how to sort of pull themselves up by the bootstraps. I'm not trying to sound like Obama, <laughs> but really understand how to take something that you know that has some a good skeleton and put some meat on the bones. Sure. So let me ask you, what is your vision for sensibility now? Now you're that man in charge. Mm -hmm. Now you can take that any direction you want. Right. What is your vision? Well, I'm really focused on development because I think that the way organizations grow by, is by having more resources. Mm -hmm. And those resources come from people having some skin in the game. Right. And for a long time, we were having partnerships with people, uh, with the organization, that didn't pay. Uh, really? And so, you know, we had corporate sponsors. Well, what was the point then? All of the people <laughs> that we service, they don't pay. It's all free for the host sites, YMCA. Um, but we had corporate sponsors that were, you know, right. having us send students over, do field trips, and sure. they weren't paying. Uh, and sort of like trial testing out phases, which I think is ridiculous. Yeah, it's crazy. And so we had to really restructure the way that we operated, and we want bank sponsors, we want corporate sponsors, that's how we survive. And you want people to pay. We want people to pay <laughs> right. for the services that we're providing right. outside of the host sites. You know, right. the, you know, YMCAs, you know, the people that we're going to to connect with, right. they don't pay, the students don't pay. So um, somebody has to pay for it to, to work, right. besides corporate sponsorship. Exactly. Because if you've got a partnership with someone, it's not really a partnership if you're not putting in. Uh, right. And so, you know, we had a contract relationship with DYCD, so we're trying to negotiate that to get more money from, D you know, they have the agency money. Sure. Um, and so, you know, hopefully connecting with some other agencies in the city, look at some private foundations and, some, you know, getting some corporate support. So we really want to focus on development from the top sure. Uh, sure. end of things. And, you know, on the bottom end, we want the services to be free. We want right. the kids to get the services that they need. Uh, we want the host sites, the YMCA's, the, you know, Boys and Girls Club. Right. We 
want them to be able to continue sure. to provide sure. this free so that we, they don't have to pay. But there are people at the top who can pay, and they right, have a sure. lot of money to give, and we want to get some of that money. Right. <laughs> um, you know, but there's a critical need for this service, financial literacy, because through our eight models, we start off with goal setting and you know how to you know budget your finances. Right. But we really talk and uh, get up to some critical things like you know investing on the stock market, planning for your future. Sure. Uh, and I didn't realize how important it was until I went to one of these sites myself. Right. I went to Bushwick, Brooklyn, and I went to this school and. Uh, there were a group of high school students and they right. were talking about uh, investing money and budgeting mm -hmm. and this was a 10th grade class right so they you know they're not toddlers they right. they, they have an, an idea of We're money teenagers, yeah. they have an idea a sense of money and after taxes you get three grand if you make fifty thousand dollars a right. year to budget right and we talk about the 50 30 20 rule right fifty percent of what you really need and and, and then you know thirty and twenty percent 30% on what you want and then 20% you save it you just right. put it right in the bank sure, sure. and so I said to them out of 3,000 how much do you think you need for an apartment to pay rent and one kid raised his hand and said you need $1,200 you need about $1,200 okay. And I thought that was somewhat reasonable. Right, I mean, you may right, get a right. shoebox, right, but right. you know, it, it's, it may not be in Manhattan, Manhattan but, right. <laughs> right? But it's something, right. and you know, maybe you, you know, you have rent stabilization right. or something. Right. <laughs> rent control, right? right. 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 Sure. Empowered to the people. Right. With that. Um, but <laughs> there was this one kid in the back who said, "You only need $170." And I was stunned, and uh, I said, well, "Where'd you, where'd you get that right. from?" And he said, you only need 170. I know that's what my grandmother pays. She's on Section 8. Oh. And I said, that's interesting because I didn't realize, even for 10th graders, you, you think that they would disconnect right. themselves from what they're living versus reality, right? right? You right, think sure. people right. know right. you right. can't right. really pay 170 right. for an right. apartment. Right. But it was the mentality of some young people who do believe that because, in some cases, they come from a generation right. of, of, of welfare right. that, sure. you know, Grandma has a section in apartment, and you know, oh, mom right. can be on yeah. section, so yeah. I can get on the program and right. pay that much. And you know, another kid raised his hand and said, "If you don't ever have money, just get food stamps." Wow, that's interesting. And he that's said that so flippantly, just get food, just go and apply for food stamps. You know, wow. and you you start to really understand how important it is uh, for this kind of program. And we had a training session for new volunteers yesterday, mm -hmm. and, and I went because we're, we're doing a lot of training and development. And we had someone talk about their personal experiences, why they want to volunteer with this organization. Right, sure. And she said, "I grew up in a home where we were on Section 8." And my mother told me when I was old enough to work that I couldn't make too much money because it would disqualify her from the program. Wow. Now, that leads me to this next question. Do, does your organization try to get them out of that mindset? That's exactly what we do. Right. And we, you know, we're DYCD, Department of Youth and Community Development, have gotten really smart and trying to connect family and parental engagement into the, the curriculum. And so we're revamping it to really meet the standards that DOE really has right. because we want the young people to understand that even though you may have this sort of circumstance in your home, we right. really want to open up your eyes and your mentality to, to what the world right. looks like. Sure. And New York is a particular beast when it comes to that right. because, of course, what you can find in Kansas or Wyoming times it by four, and that's what you're paying in New York. That's right. Uh, and so $50,000 here is nothing compared to what it would be in Nashville, Tennessee. Right, right? correct. Right. Uh, so we try to get them to understand that even if you make good money, you really have to know what you're doing with it because if you don't, you're going to spend it on things you don't need. Right. Uh, and things that eventually don't bring any value to your life, right. right? So which leads me to this, then you have to explain, not only to kids, but I think to people, adults, the difference between rich, being rich, and being wealthy. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that would go a long way. Do you teach kids the difference? You know, kids, oh, I want to be rich. Mm -hmm. And some kids, well, I want to be wealthy. But they have to know the difference right. between the two. Right. You guys teach them that? We do. And that's why we talk about stocks and investments, because right. a lot of people don't understand, even compounding interest, a lot right. of people don't understand that your money grows over a period of time. You right. should let it work for you. Right. Uh, and those very basic concepts that a lot of people who have that kind of knowledge know. Right. Others don't. I remember when I was growing up, and my mother won't like the story. <laughs> uh, but she used to always tell me that, you know, 
Caucasians right. <laughs> uh, would wear busted up sneakers forever, right? right. And African Americans got to go and run and get the new pair of Jordans. That's right. Uh, and do you really need that, right? Uh, can, can you get Skechers or Nike or something else that's right. not expensive? You know, hundreds of dollars on sneakers. Right. I used Ridiculous. to have a friend uh, <laughs> growing up with a collection of Jordans, and they were hundreds of dollars a pair for, for one pair, right. right? Right, right, And you add that up, and you go, wow, you could have you know, you taken your family out of the project. Right, right. exactly. <laughs> but that's the mentality. That's right, that mentality. right. It's right. the mentality that they've got to have the Jordan sneakers, right? Right. Uh, you know, they're, they're, drying, you know, they're driving a hoopty lemon, but they've right. got to have the Jordan sneakers. Uh, and you, you start to really connect them uh, to what they really want and what they really need. Right. And then you start asking questions. People want to be educated. You right. know, if you, sure. sit, if you stand in front of a classroom of people, not just young people, and you say, raise your hand if you love money. Right. They, they all <laughs> do that. Right. Everybody loves money. Right. Sure. Raise your hand if you know how to spend your money. Uh, right. sort of it, it, it <laughs> kind of goes up. Right. Raise your hand if you know how to invest your money, right? Nobody. And then one thing that I learned because I grew up in an African American Baptist church all my life, right. um, so there I. is a huge disconnect between life insurance and African American families. That's right. And people say to themselves, I don't believe in life insurance. In fact, my mother has a friend who doesn't have life insurance, doesn't right. believe in it. Uh, and he said, you spend all your life saving, you know, putting money into this pot, and then, you know, you, by the time you die, you just gave them more than you get. Right, right. And in some cases, that's true. Right. But in most cases, when that happens, and you pay more money than right. you get back when you die, you haven't saved up that money anyway. Right, right. right? That, that money would have went to other things, right. and that's your exactly bank right. account is still at zero. Right. And now your family has to come to the table and start begging people. I can't tell you how many times we've got calls growing up right. with right. this person who needed money to help bury somebody and this right. person right. who needed right. money to help. Right. And, you know, you that's sit there. It's prevalent in the black family. Still, it's to absolutely this day. prevalent right. in the black family. And so whenever I'm in a room and, and you know, I, I connect with the African American volunteers right, sure. and they know, and I say, let's talk about things that aren't in our curriculum. Right. right? Right. But understanding that these are things that absolutely impact our communities. Absolutely. We're trying to get, you know, really diversify the pool of the people that are instructors and with their backgrounds and with their interests because we want the kids to really relate to the people right. who are sure. doing these instructions. Um, and um, I really think that this work is absolutely needed and critical. And people walk away and we encourage them to have a conversation with the parents about it. And that's another thing, Roy. Did it, will it ever progress to you guys going, Sensibility going from teaching the kids because it's it's kind of hard for the a, a kid to go back and say, "Mom, Dad, this is what I learned. Maybe you should practice that." Do you know how African Americans? And I'm not saying all, but you know how some African American parents get. You don't think you know more than me, uh -huh. uh, you know? Would it ever be to a point where you would bring in the uh, the people of color, the parents, mm -hmm. to show them how to um, manage their money? Right. I think that's probably more of a long-term conversation. And I think that the more you know, I do research on the development side with grants, et cetera, community development, there is money out there for that. And right. so that's a conversation about you know how we want to sort of change the mission that we have as an organization, if we want to do that. Right. Uh, we haven't had that conversation yet. But I will tell you that the biggest issue that I've seen with parents in particular about these issues is they don't want to admit that they don't know. Right. Right. And I, I say to them, and, and, I, and I love talking about this issue when it comes to financial pride, because I love people who can admit that they don't know what right. they're doing. Right. I love Absolutely. that. And um, I, was do, I did a, a newspaper article for some online publication who asked my right. advice about something. Right. And I said, the best thing you can do is admit to yourself that you really have no clue what you're doing. Right. Right. And, start. you know, right. there are people around you, even if you don't realize it, who would help you if right. you asked. You right. know, people, if you have a bank account. Right. People don't realize that all the people, when you walk into a bank, those community service representatives, the, the bank tellers, the people who are sitting at the tables, right. the, you know, in the cubicles, they are all there to work for you. Right. These, these are people you who... putting your money in their bank. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And so I don't care if it's Carver or Chase or M&T. Right. Right. You walk in there and you can sit down. Right. In some cases, you don't even make an appointment. You, you can just, just walk, walk in. in. Right. Sure. Sit down. They, they're there. Sit down and say, I need help understanding this. I right. need help understanding that. Many people go to... X, Y, and Z, Jackson, Hewitt, H&R Block right. to get their taxes. Right. Those are people who work for you. They right. help you save money and pay right. less money to the government if you right. qualify for right. deductions, et cetera. Those people, you should use them to ask questions. They, they're getting finances. your right. few hundred dollars to prepare your return. They right. can take you know, 10 minutes and talk about whatever issues right. that you have a concern with. So we want to talk to people about how to 
really use the people in your life who, in most cases, won't even charge you right. extra mm -hmm. to get the kind of services that you need. Right. Right. That is simply, what you do is simply amazing. And I am proud to see another black man. And I don't usually try to bring color into it, but to see a black man. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to see my face. <laughs> We're friends on Facebook. I yes, you do. <laughs> but I am so proud to see that you're progressing and trying to mold the young people. You mold mm -hmm. your minds, and especially about finances, because in our community, we lack, we lack the knowledge mm -hmm. of finance. And I am very proud to sit here across from you that I'm going to bring you back for part two mm -hmm. to ask you, your, you know, the difference is you have kids that come from, um, like, you know, poor families um, in Manhattan. Like, you know the school board. From um, Stuyvesant up to 96th Street, they're all public schools. Mm -hmm. And they all get the same funding that the Bronx and the Harlem get. Why is there a vast difference in, 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 in uh, access? They will never be equity when it comes to funding for education. They won't. You will always have certain school districts who don't need the money they're getting. Right. And then you will always have school districts who need more money and just don't get it. Right. What you've got to do, and I, and I, I was at a meeting today with the, the borough president's office in Brooklyn, Eric right. Adams people, and I was telling them, you've got to create public-private partnerships. You right. have to say, this is the void. Right. And yes, we can talk all day about what we don't have, and right. we can say, well, schools on the Upper West Side have more money and they don't need it. Right. It's not going to work right. because the lawmakers are very diverse, right? right? You have 51 council members, and they're not going to all agree that right. you should take money from one area and put it here, right? right. right. You're not going to ever have consensus on what equity looks right. like. Right. But you can say to yourselves, if you're innovative, right? right, you can say, we have this problem in our community. Right. How do we get a J.P. Morgan? How do we get an X, Y, and Chase. Z to come yeah. in and invest so that we can start to fill the gaps? Right. And we were talking about homelessness because the city of New York is having a huge problem right now right. with homelessness. Right. I was on the phone yesterday with Robin Hood Foundation right. and we were trying to get them to support a program, mm -hmm. financial literacy, young people especially in homeless shelters and what the nexus would be between the financial literacy they get and how it affects their math scores and possibly sure. the graduation rates, right? And they said, oh that sounds like a wonderful idea. Get someone to fund it, do it for two, three years as a pilot and then come back to us, right? <laughs> and of course, if everyone had to do that, right. <laughs> then we won't ever need people, right. but uh, nonprofits, in my case particularly, but other people don't have the money, the resources to fund an idea, right. and then let Robin Hood come on the back end after you've proven the right. model. Right. But what we can do is that the city agencies can fund these types of initiatives, right. and they can think. I, as the executive director of a nonprofit, shouldn't be the one to say, how do we come up with an idea <laughs> right. that can they be funded be to you. so Robin Hood can right. fund it? Right? Right. They should be saying to themselves, the commissioner, X, Y, and Z, should say, we have a problem with homelessness. Right. How do we connect all the issues that we have to the people who can fund it and really put some traction right. on this? Right. So let's come up with innovative ideas. And I don't know if they're thinking about it. I'm not saying they're not. Right. Maybe sure. they are. Right. And who knows? There might be a door opening there, and I don't want to close it. <laughs> but you know, thinking about how to come up with ways right. to fund these types of programs that can have some wheels on them and then go to Robin Hood and say, why don't you expand this, fund it, et cetera. Right. That's what we have to be doing in the public sector and that's how we attract the private sector. Wow, so let me ask you this. So now you're the director, executive director. Sensibility, what, what is your personal, that's your last stop? What, what, what's your long-term goal, personally? Since you, <laughs> since you, after you bring these guys trillions of dollars, then uh, what? I knew you were going to ask Did you know this. that? <laughs> um, you know, I, I am still figuring that out. And, and I have become more comfortable as I've gotten older to say that I'm 21, 22? Um, I, I'm 12. <laughs> 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 um, I, I just have a gold tee. Just, <laughs> but I'm, I'm becoming comfortable with saying I just don't know yet. Right, sure. Um, I, I like the idea of the private nonprofit sector. Mm -hmm. I think that I'm pretty good at making decisions, which is why I think I'm comfortable in these types of positions. Right. 
um, you know, going to a bigger foundation seems like a great idea. You right. can impact more people sure. and you're funded, right? You don't have to right. go out right. seeking funds. You, right. You've sure. got a pile of, of, of money and, you know, the dividends of the organization have made it grow and right. you can be in existence for the next hundred years. You know, right. there's Robin Hood, there's Ford. I mean, there's so many great foundations. Mm -hmm. I would love to be on that side of things. Mm -hmm. If not, I'm happy to be in a space where I can grow and utilize right. my skills. Right. I don't sure. like being limited. Right. Sure. Uh, I like the idea that in this particular role, I have ideas, I can enact them. Yeah. Um, if they work, we continue them. If they don't work, we don't continue them. Right, right. But I don't have anyone really, and the board is fairly you know, laxed when it comes to me doing things that I want to do. Right. And so I don't, I don't feel like I'm being challenged um, with my decisions. Okay, so I'm, I'm happy where I'm at. I would right. like to continue that on a grander scale, right. depending on whatever opportunities open up. Sure. But that may also mean that I take sensibility to a place where it's comfortable and it's, you know, it grows. And becomes wealthy. I may just stay here. Right. I mean, so you know. um, are you the major fundraiser for um, Sensibility now? Um, I am the chief fundraiser. Chief right? fundraiser. Right, because so you're out every night. Hobnobbing Absolutely. And hands um, and it, it's like, well, it's better than a campaign for public office. Right, sure. Um, but I'm running for an idea. I'm running for a premise that people can buy into. Right. And we just happen to be lucky enough to be in the financial literacy space. Right. And so the people who have the money, the banks in right. particular, the financial institutions, the hedge funds, they want to give back right. to an organization that's helping young people in particular in the industry that they live in, right? This right. is how they make their money. Right. And so they can say, yeah, we can take some of our profit and invest it in something like this. Wow. So what is your biggest... What is your biggest opposition? What is your biggest, what would be your biggest wall that you have to overcome in doing that? Well, I think whenever you're getting funding from people, if you seem to be stable, people like that, and in some cases, they don't like that. Right. Some people look at you and say, well, you're supported by Society General. Your office is on Park Avenue. Right, right. You got you, money. You don't need any money from us. <laughs> and, and that's not the case. I right. mean, we have operating expenses that, that get covered um, because, you know, we don't have a lot of overhead because, right. you know, we, we were using the space. We get all of our printing, et cetera. You know, we, we have minimal expenses when it comes to output, but we want to grow. We want to expand beyond what Society General right. has given us. There are other cities mm -hmm. uh, in different states. We mm -hmm. can go to New Jersey. We can go to Chicago. We can go to Washington, D.C., Los see Angeles. Do you um, see yourself? You see, you see sensibility being in other states like I suspect, Detroit, yeah, Chicago. I suspect that at least within the next two to three years, we will be in at least one other city. Would um, you be the executive director there, or you guys? You guys, you guys would be the parent. We would be the parent. I would be the executive director, and I suspect we would have regional directors. Regional directors who will be in those cities or states doing that wow, work. Wow! Wow! Yeah. I see we're running out of time. Roy, really? That's it. That's it. Was and that look, an hour? <laughs> look, Roy, you know what's going to happen. I'm so, you have, this is probably one of the best interviews, if not the best interview. Oh, you're just saying No, that. I'm not. You're besides that. besides that, of course not. But I want you to come back. Okay. Um, if not this year, the beginning of the year, so we Happy can talk to do more. Yeah. Um, tell us where, how people can get a hold of sense of sensibility. Um, uh, Google sensibility, C-E-N-T-S ability. Um, our website is there. Financial Literacy New York were the first ones that pop up thanks wow. to Google AdWords. So how's it going to work on Park Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> Does the car pick you up, Roy? You know, the, the, car the, car, the, the car doesn't, doesn't pick you up, Roy? Come the on. car doesn't pick me up. I will tell you that it, it looks great um, you know, from the outside until you walk in and you realize you're not making millions of dollars like the other people in the elevator, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. Roy, thank you so much. Thank you. Guys, this has been a great show. I want to thank everybody for watching us. My guest today was Roy R. Paul. Um, he's the man at Sensibility Executive Director. We'll be back next week. Remember this, shoot for the moon. If you miss, you're still among the stars. And I'm your host, Greg Lasseter. Talk to you soon. I like that. I'm going to use that. <laughs> shoot for the moon, and if you miss, you're still, still among the stars. I like that. I wish I could have said I was the original guy, but I wasn't. Oh, who said that? I don't even know. I've been saying this since I was oh, no. 20, 20. You might get sued.